Standing beside his car, the small, stockily built man exuded confidence, despite the fact he'd been stopped by police and was carrying drugs of a street value of £250,000. Even when officers opened the boot to reveal 10 kilos of cannabis, Darren Nichols barely turned a hair. It's chocolate bars, isn't it? He joked. Nichols' bravado was based on his position as a police informer. For almost a year, he'd been passing on information about fellow drug dealers, and he'd developed a close relationship with two police handlers. Unfortunately, shortly before his arrest on May 13th, 1996, Nichols received very bad news. Both of his police contacts were themselves under arrest and facing charges. Worse quickly followed. In addition to the drugs offences, he was told he was being charged with the murders of Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe, three brutal gangsters blasted to death in a Range Rover at Rettendon, Essex, six months earlier, in what was to become one of the most notorious killings of the decade. Mobile phone records showed Nichols had been close to the murder scene on the night in question. He was a known drug dealer and former associate of victim Pat Tate. Darren Nichols knew he was in serious trouble and made a decision. On May 15th, 1996, Nichols started to talk, making the first of more than 20 statements. He named his friends Jack Wombs and Mick Steele as the murderers and claimed he had been duped into driving the getaway car. He stuck to his story in court and in the face of glaring inconsistencies, a jury believed him. Wombs and Steele were each given triple life sentences, but now new evidence has cast growing doubt on the safety of their convictions. A miscarriage of justice in such a case would have implications as serious as those raised by the release of the Birmingham Six and Guildford Four. The reputation of our police and legal system rests on the word of Darren Nichols, a counterfeiter, drug dealer and self-confessed liar. It is not a comforting thought. Nichols had met Steele and Wombs in Hollersley Bay Open Prison. He was finishing a sentence for counterfeiting, having been caught with £130,000 in forged £10 notes. Mick Steele was at the end of a nine-year sentence for cannabis importation. Intelligent, articulate and charismatic, Steele was someone Nichols admired. Jack Wombs was altogether different. He had no previous criminal record but was serving 16 months after foolishly becoming involved in a fraudulent car insurance claim. Nichols had latched on to Steele and Wombs at Hollersley Bay, and after all three had completed their sentences and had been released, he seemed determined to maintain the friendship. It meant Nichols knew all about their habits and movements. Nichols told police that on the night of December 6th, 1995, he had travelled with Wombs and Steele to the Wheat Sheaf pub in Rettendon, expecting to pick up a consignment of cocaine. Nichols had driven his own VW Passat, accompanied by Wombs, while Steele had driven his Toyota Hilux. Nichols said they waited in the car park until a dark blue Range Rover pulled up, carrying Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. According to Nichols, Steele joined Tate in the Range Rover and it pulled away. Sitting in the Passat, Jack Wombs told Nichols to drop him in nearby Workhouse Lane, the eventual scene of the murders. Wombs said he would phone when he needed Nichols to collect him. At 7pm, the call came. According to Nichols, it was only when a blood-splattered Wombs and Steele clambered into the Passat that he realised a murder had taken place. He was so shocked he almost collided with a white van as he drove away. Despite his revulsion and horror vividly recounted in court, for six months Nichols made no mention of these events. An electrician, he continued his work rewiring Mick Steele's new house. He told the court Wombs and Steele were planning to murder him, but thought nothing of taking his wife and young children on repeated social visits to Steele's house. If Nichols is telling the truth, his conduct is hard to explain. But Nichols has a long record of lying and fabricating evidence, as he admitted in court. During the murder trial, evidence offered by tracing mobile phone calls was crucial. Records from Nichols' Orange Phone and Wombs' Vodafone put both men in the Rettendon area at around 7pm on the night of the murder. Wombs' phone record showed he made two calls to Nichols at 6.59pm. The first lasted less than two seconds and cut off. Wombs' second call lasted for four seconds. Nichols' story is that this was Wombs calling from the murder scene on Workhouse Lane, telling Nichols to come and get me. 
The police used this evidence, plus the fact that none of the three deceased used their phones after 6.44pm, to fix the time of death at just prior to 7pm. Jack Wombs told a different story. A professional mechanic, Wombs agreed he'd driven to Rettenden that night, but said he'd only taken a trailer to pick up Nichols broken down VW Passat. The car had been left in the car park of the Wheat Sheaf pub, where Nichols claims the meeting with the doomed gangsters took place. Wombs said he loaded the car onto the trailer and phoned Nichols to tell him, but Wombs heard only static and the call was terminated. Despite Nichols' lurid descriptions of Wombs entering the Passat dripping with blood, forensic tests failed to link the car to the murders. In court, mobile phone experts argued for several days over whether it was possible to determine Wombs' location when he called Nichols. It is generally agreed that the jury were confused by technicalities. It has taken two years for the defence team to get hold of Wombs' mobile phone for tests to prove his story. Their repeated requests were greeted with obstructions. Expert David Bristow finally made his test in January of this year. It is important to understand that in certain places, a mobile call could connect to any one of three or four different servers. Wombs' call connected to what is known as the Hockley 54.3 server. David Bristow made 20 test calls from the Wheat Sheaf pub car park, where Wombs said he was, and 40 calls from Workhouse Lane, Nichols' story. Vodafone's results show that of the 20 calls from the Wheat Sheaf, over a third were picked up by the Hockley 54.3 server. Of the 40 calls from the murder scene on Workhouse Lane, not one connected with Hockley 54.3. As David Bristow points out, the calls were made with Wombs' own phone, at the same time of year as the murders and the same time of day. The conclusion seems inescapable. When Jack Wombs says he was in the Wheat Sheaf car park and not the murder scene, he was telling the truth. There is, of course, a postscript to this. If Darren Nichols wasn't driving Jack Wombs in his Passat, just what was he doing that night in Rettenden? Having made his statements to the police, Darren Nichols was placed on the protected witness program. All such prisoners are eventually given new identities, and in the meantime they are known as Blogs. Nichols was Blogs 19. While awaiting the murder trial, Darren spent time in a secure unit at Woodhill Milton Keynes. Earlier this year, I received a surprising call from a man who had seen my previous articles on the Essex murders. Like Nichols, my caller was a Blogs. I'll refer to him as The Professor. The Professor said he met Nichols at the Woodhill unit, a fact Nichols confirms in a recent newspaper article. The Professor remembers Nichols as a nervous wreck who drove his police handlers mad with endless demands and suicide threats. Early in 1997, The Professor says Nichols asked to speak to him in private. He said his story he was supposed to tell in court was a pack of lies. Nichols asked the professor if he should go through with it. His reply was simple. If Nichols was telling lies, he'd better not get caught. Not long after this conversation, Darren Nichols was granted bail. The professor told me he assumed that Wombs and Steele were guilty and wasn't unduly bothered. He said, quote, I thought they were forensics, witnesses. I could ignore Darren's perjury because I thought he was just a cherry on the cake. Now I realise Darren wasn't the cherry on the cake. He was the cake. After seeing the mail articles, the professor understood what the trial judge pointed out. The entire case rested on Nichols' testimony. In court, Nichols claimed that Steele had decided to murder Tate, Tucker and Rolf because of ill feeling about a failed cannabis deal. Nichols' earlier statements tell a very different story. But the motive he first suggested cannot possibly be true, for the simple reason that such a motive didn't exist until six weeks after the three men died. Between February the 7th and 18th, 1996, two months after the murders, Mick Steele received a number of threatening phone calls. The calls were apparently from two IRA men, demanding the return of money they had lent to Pat Tate. When Steele said this was nothing to do with him, they threatened to kill him. He became suspicious, and rightly so. In fact, the IRA men were police involved in a bizarre bid to get information on the murders. Darren Nichols heard about the calls when he was doing electrical work at Mick Steele's house. He claimed in his police statements that Steele murdered Pat Tate because Tate told the Irishman that Steele had their missing money. Unfortunately, neither Nichols nor the interviewing officers realised the Irishman were undercover police, nor did they remember that the Irishman had only materialised six weeks after Pat Tate's death, 
and so could not provide a motive for his murder. When the error was spotted, the Irishman disappeared from Nichols' statements. The tapes of Nichols' police interviews include odd gaps, missing words and background noises. Defence specialists conclude they had been tampered with. The highly eccentric nature of his testimony and his apparent reliance on police guidance can be seen in the following excerpts. May the 14th, 1996. Ugh, I've messed the story up again here. I'll get it in the right order soon. May the 17th, 1996. See me through it, if I remember. May the 20th, 1996. I'm hoping you'll remind me of things I can't remember. According to the prosecution case, Tate, Tucker and Rolf died at approximately 7pm on December the 6th, 1995. However, several factors point to a later time of death. The Range Rover was untouched by snow or ice, despite standing out on a freezing night. Two local witnesses thought they heard shots between 10pm and midnight, while a third walked his dog along the murder lane at 7.30pm and was adamant the Range Rover was not there. I have discovered new evidence which seems to support this theory of a later time of murder. On December 6th, 1995, between 8.30pm and 8.45pm, a man I shall call Ian was driving his white van towards the Rettendon roundabout. Pulling up alongside was a dark blue Range Rover, carrying four men. In the back seat, Ian immediately recognised the hulking figure of Pat Tate, one of the most well-known men in that part of Essex, who according to Nichols had already been dead for over 90 minutes. Ian also saw a second passenger. The man cut a striking figure, tall and thin, wearing what looked like a black trench coat with shoulder-length blonde hair. The Range Rover accelerated up Rettendon Hill, but a moment later Ian's white van was forced to swerve violently to avoid it after the Range Rover U-turned and headed towards the murder scene. There is a secondary point of interest in Ian's story. Nichols said that as he drove Wombs and Steele away from the murder scene, his shock caused him to almost crash into a white van. In fact, it was the blue Range Rover which had the near miss, again with a white van, in the same location Nichols described. Pure coincidence, or had Nichols witnessed the first near crash and used it to embroider his own story? In January, I visited both Jack Wombs and Mick Steele in their respective high security prisons. Both men continue to insist they are innocent. Mick Steele is 52 and devotes his time to studying legal texts and fighting for his case to be reheard. He rings his common law wife Jackie, the childhood sweetheart who has been his partner for 17 years, every night. Jack Wombs is now 39. He too phones home every day, speaking to his wife Gail and their two children. His large family continues to campaign to clear his name. During my visit to HMP Whitemore, where Jack Wombs is held, several prison officers spoke to me. They told me Wombs was a thoroughly nice man, that his family were very decent people. There was a problem with this conviction, they said, perhaps remembering that as Darren Nichols gave his evidence in court, he was asked if he was a truthful man. Not particularly, he replied. If you would like to learn more about the Range Rover murders, then click on the video in front of you now. You will also see the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.